Uh, you could add your own, uh, you could have it just XOR a bunch of bits to um, mix up the disassembler. You could make it jump ahead six words so that whatever comes after it doesn't apply. And all of this can be done simply by writing the interrupt handler to look at the uh, return location and the, um, the stack and similar things and then repairing it. There's a Paco GTFO article in which uh, a fellow wrote uh, a tool that would do this for desktop Linux so that you can just tell an application not to crash. And whenever it triggers a SIG fault or a SIG bus, it just sort of jumps a few bytes further and hopes that it's good to execute. <laughs> Don't recommend it, but you know. And if it was good enough for Visual Basic 6, it's good enough for me. Ship it. <laughs> So we took this same trick and we said, OK, well, it doesn't work on Thumb 2, but let's try it out on MIPS 16. Right? And so that was our next target. And it, it doesn't work. Well, so uh, to read this, uh, F000 is a prefix word that changes nothing in the instruction that follows. It is um, like a prefix word that Does not. has no change. Um, 6500 is the no-op. So what this means is extend the no-op with a longer immediate value, and that value is 0. But the no-op doesn't actually use an immediate value. And they were smart enough to look for this. So the CPU will actually recognize that the prefix is not compatible with this particular instruction, that and, they, yeah. you can't extend an immediate when you don't have an immediate, and it triggers an illegal in instruction error. So what we found is that you have to be careful. Right? You have to only be extending ones that can take immediates in this case. So we went back to the manual and realized we couldn't just do this in a bar one night. We actually had to get out the manual. And we found it. In fact, it was sort of funny. We, we found an old copy of it. But we were wondering, you know, could we get a book? And we can try, if we look down here, to what? get uh, it via fax. That's then, a pretty long manual. Then we were practicing our slides in a bar, and we actually called these numbers. The 800 number had been disconnected, but the international number was... Uh, Joy Cauldron. Joy, yeah. Joy did not enjoy being woken up at 4.30 in the morning, and we'd like to apologize to Joy for the interruption. Um, <laughs> so just saying, the, these will not work, and, and neither does the FTP or, or anything in this but, case anymore. But this might be salvageable, because um, you know, the, the prefix word, even though it's adding immediate values of 0, like even though it has no net effect, it also changes, I mean, it's still there. It's not like it, it's a no-op. It, it does something. It's enough to crash. So maybe we could find like, the, the worst time to actually use this instruction. So we go back to our computer architecture book, right, or a class, and, and uh, Travis really enjoyed that. And, and so this is a simple example that we'll show you in a moment what a real pipeline looks like. But for the sake of argument, we'll talk about a simple five-stage MIPS pipeline, right? And as I'm sure most of you remember, you have it step through, and there's multiple things going through the pipeline at once. It instruction fetches, and then instruction decodes, then executes the instruction, accesses memory, does the write back, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so we're going to take advantage of, of one of the architectural properties from this. So the actual stages are more complicated. But well, before you hit it, the five stages here are instruction fetch, meaning that the CPU grabs the instruction off of memory. Instruction decode, which is when it actually converts that to its internal expanded representation that it can run. Execute, which is where it performs the operation, if it's a register operation. Mem, which is the memory operation. So if it's not an internal operation, but it's actually reading from or writing to memory as a data access, this is where the data access happens. And then write back which is where the result is written back into the registers. And this is when the, the world changes. This is when the, the state is recorded. And it's called a pipeline because multiple stages are happening at once. In uh, time slot two, the first instruction is decoding while the second instruction is being fetched. And in, uh, in time slot three, the second one has moved, each one moves on, and then they execute in parallel. And 
this allows your code to be faster because you can do multiple things at the same time. You can be fetching one instruction while you're executing another and storing the result of a third all at once. So first, to take a quick look, right? The pipelines are more like 15, 16 stages in MIPS, or 14 for 15, I guess. So, so thanks to Ange for the POC or GTFO article. Um, where he illustrated what a true pipeline looks like, complete with shoots and ladders for your optional game playing pleasure on the pipeline. Um, <laughs> Is it shoots and ladders or snakes and ladders here? Snakes. 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 Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, bad. Uh, so in this case, like the, we'll, the instructions we'll can actually go down different paths, right? And, and it varies by their width. So, the the three ones over here, those are only used for variable length instructions. Those are only used for MIP sixteen. It's too complicated to think about all of the different stages that are, are in this diagram unless you're actually implementing the chip or you need a perfectly accurate emulator, which is why we reason about it with the five-stage pipeline, even though we know that that's a fiction. So from either of these pipelines, we take away a core architectural concept. And we're not going to read this to you because we're humane. But the key thing to take away is that there's a branch delay slot in MIPS, which means architecturally, after something like a return or a branch instruction, the next instruction word will execute. Um, and this is just a consideration. It comes out of the pipelining and, and so forth. So um, after branch, after return, these will still run. So for example, on, on x86, if you had like um Let's say you're calling a function with a parameter of 0. In x86, you move the 0 value into the location that's used by the first parameter, and then you do the function call. In MIPS, you do the call, and then you 0 the register. And you do it out of order because the register will be 0'd by the time the next function be has been called. And this little extra slot allows for a performance benefit of 10% or so if you do not have out of order execution. So it, it keeps your CPUs simpler. And so let's take a look at how this is used, right? So in a simple compiler that is not taking advantage of this increase or if it can't for this function for whatever reason, it'll put a no op in this slot, right? So you'll see a return um, E820. And then right after that, you'll get that same no op we saw again. Nothing happens, perfectly harmless. But say you have the return value v0, and you want to add 1 to it. right? So this is the instruction 4a01, which just adds 1 to that register. Um, and so what will happen is by the time wherever this is, as Travis was saying, by the time that wherever this is returning to gets execution and starts to write, run at stages that actually care about looking in this register, the execute stage in, in this case, um, it will have already modified it and added one. So we started looking, OK, what could we put here? Right? We saw earlier that if we just extended a no-op in general, it didn't work. Uh, it realized that the hardware caught that that was not legal. But, uh, and that's what you'll see, you're seeing here. Right? We put a prefix word on a no-op. We got a bus error. As we said, we tried all different types of variants of this also got bus errors because it was illegal. But what if we have a prefix word in the delay slot? What if we have a two instruction long instruction in the delay slot, which only has room for one instruction word? The two ways to guess that this might behave, you might assume that either the entire instruction is executed, or you might assume that the single instruction, then the prefix word, then applies to whatever instruction is next in the caller function. But neither is what happens. So delay slots are a hardware efficiency hack. They are a cheap way for the CPU designer to get a small performance benefit by pushing the complexity out of the CPU and into the assembler. So the assembler has to know to reorder the instructions so that the CPU doesn't need to be able to reorder instructions. This saves you space in silicon. But it also means that pieces of the CPU's internal design and architecture are exposed to the machine language program. So because they're an efficiency hack, uh, only one word is actually fetched by the hardware 
sort of. What actually happens is that more than just the next instruction are loaded. The next several are loaded in order to fill the pipeline. But they're blasted away in what's called a pipeline flush, where everything that is early in the pipeline, everything except for the very next pipeline stage, is wiped away. And the reason for that is that the delay slot has already finished executing by the time the branch occurs. It just hasn't been able to write its results back. So it's not that one extra instruction is being executed. It's that one instruction is allowed to live while the rest are being flushed away and murdered. So in the case of, of this switch, the next instruction is only executed if it is already finished, which means if its results are ready to be written back. And these prefix words are a bit special. They don't actually do anything themselves. They hang around in the instruction decoder to rewrite the next instruction in line. And when they do this, they let a no-op bubble, as it's called, continue to move on in the pipeline in their place. Yep. And so let's look at some of the test cases, right? So we started coding this up. We'd try these both on real hardware, but also in an emulator, in this case, QMU. Uh, we tried a few others. They have similar results, but are more of a pain to work with. Um, so first of all, right, let's just do the return and no-op. Right? This was the one we showed you earlier. This was the control case. Nothing of interest. right? We're going to return. And, and by the way, the instruction we're running before this is to populate the return register with a 0, right? just for a simple thing. So we moved 0 to v0, which is the return register in MIPS. We then ran a return followed by a no-op. Thankfully, it returns zero. We're all happy, right? And, and we expect these two to be the same because you know this is like our control case. If if the emulator messed up this instruction, nothing would work. <laughs> so then next, we took and input the extend of a no op in the delay slot. Interestingly, this is where we start to see a difference, right? The hardware is like okay, nothing happens, zero, right? This is what Travis was just alluding to, where it becomes. Uh, basically a no-op bubble in the pipeline because the second, in the third word, third instruction word in this case, never is really processed by, by the hardware. But QMU was like, yeah, I'm going to try to run this. But it emulated it correctly. It crashed. Right? It threw a bus error. It's like, you, you, I mean, I did that, which I shouldn't have done, but, but you can't do that, so I'm going to crash. And then we, the, you saw this case earlier. We talked about this. Not after a return, both will throw a bus error, right? So that's sort of we have in there to explain the, uh, the, the behavior of the above. Um, but then we were like, well, you don't want to, if you're doing anti-emulation, you don't want to just crash a system in an emulator, right? That sticks out a lot. You start, somebody's like, really? So how can we get it so we just have a simple conditional, <laughs> right? So by putting an add word after the extension, so the extension does nothing to the add word, right? We run that 4A01 that you saw. As we explained earlier, it reliably adds a 1. Now, again, to go back to the pipeline, right? On real hardware, this would be the only thing executing, only that one instruction word. It'll be flushed out of the pipeline um, and, and act like a no-op. But in QMU, QMU saw it, and it's like, well, I'm it's extending something. I better grab the next one and uh, do that, too. And it did, very reliably, it was so kind, to add one to the return value. So this is now a six byte long function that reliably distinguishes between a software emulation and real hardware. So to look at it, right, um, this is just explaining that and putting the function, I guess, in another format. This is the early one, the one that, that crashes QMO. Yep, yep. So, Part of the reason why QMU crashes, why it interprets the entire long, um, long delay slot instruction, is that QMU does not actually have a pipeline for MIPS. When it's emulating MIPS code, it assumes that the code will run linearly in the way that the, uh, the compiler intended. And it leaves out the performance hacks that only add performance on real hardware. Because if it were to accurately emulate them, that would make it a lot more expensive in software. So it's sort of disassembling each instruction and then doing whatever the disassembly says. So it disassembles the return. It's like, OK, I know I'm returning. 
I need a delay slot, so I'm going to run one more instruction and then I'm going to return. And then it disassembles the next instruction where it gets the full illegal instruction and triggers the bus error. If we, yes. So if we change this to the non-crashing form, the one that adds one to the return value on QAMU but does not on software. In this case, the disassembly is now a legal instruction, something that, that can safely run, and that's why it's allowed through in QAMU. On hardware, it is not allowed through because it gets broken in half. The first, uh, the extension word, the F000, hangs around. It stays in the instruction decoder and lets a no-op bubble go forward, and the no-op bubble does nothing. As the second instruction gets changed, but the second instruction is too far back in the pipeline. So there is a delay slot instruction that's allowed to finish. It's just that that delay slot instruction is a no-op bubble instead of a real instruction, because the real instruction is one pipeline stage too late. So if we take this and we put it into shell code, right, we can write a program that basically is going to, in main, very simple case, say, I'm running, and then check the return value from this function that we're going to call. Right, and you see this exec shellcode 16. It's in the, in the zip file inside the PDF. If you want it, but very simple, it's just going to jump to that shellcode, run it through, and e depending on if a 0 or a 1 comes back, it's going to print out a different thing. Now, if you're actually making an anti-emulation technique, I suggest maybe leaving out the strings, but <laughs> I, I think you get the point. This right? would be fine for a capture the flag, though. Yeah. I mean, cool. contrived examples have their purpose. So in the real world, what you would do is you would run through, say, a large program, and you would take some fraction of the delay slots, and you would add uh, annoying instructions there. Right? So just like 20% uh, of your functions <coughs> accidentally return one more than they ought to. Or one less. Or one or less. Or multiply. Or whatever. Right? Or your password hashing algorithm is different in emulation than it is in your real hardware. Your domain generation. I mean, uh, sorry. <laughs> right, right. So you don't, um, as you're uh, listing command and control domains, you know, like they can all be different. You, you would, you wouldn't do that. Oh, uh, only not. if you're doing remote device management for right. enterprise. <laughs> and the great thing is, it actually works in this case. Thank goodness. Right. Yeah. So this is a picture of the rig that uh, we got last minute before we were finalizing this. So Torsten Haas is a good friend of mine, and. Um, we have uh, this tradition of helping each other when we really need it, but maybe being a jerk about it. So uh, I, I, I call him up very late at night. I said, I need a shell account on a MIPS machine, and I need it now. I remember that you did a bunch of embedded router stuff. Can you hook me up? He's like, absolutely. Gives me a shell account. Everything is good until I try to install the Emacs, and I realize that the entire machine has two megabytes of disk space. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, meant that it was sort of a little, and you'll see on the next slide from our output, it was compiling and then SSH transferring the binary to target and running it and then getting off because we didn't even like save it there on disk. Um, so here you're seeing the difference, right? This is that program we showed you earlier up above on my Ubuntu VM or whatever it was running QMU. Um, yes, I am running in QMU. And then, in case that wasn't clear, um, and then on the, the shell down below, SSHing to the target. Um, Travis, I don't know why you aliased it so we couldn't see the IP here. But um, uh, it, It's I'm aliased because it has to go through four jump boxes before it actually yeah. gets there. Yeah. We're paying. yeah. Um, and you see that it's running here on real hardware, right? So I hope now at this point, we hope now at this point, you see that we can reliably mess with an emulator. But don't worry, like we have static reverse engineers in the room. You guys are awesome in, at looking through, finding the issues. And so let's look at what it would look like in IDA, right? So if you look at it in IDA, you'll see the right hand side. Because what I'm covering up doesn't show up in IDA by default. We changed so the settings here. This line here, sanity. add IU v01, that is the fictitious instruction that the real hardware ignores because it gets broken in half. But as you're viewing it, uh, especially if you know MIPS but you maybe haven't used it in the past couple of months, um, you might forget that this is an extended instruction, that this shouldn't fit within uh, a delay slot. And the bytes on the left, 
are hidden from you. Because IDA doesn't show you the opcodes unless you specifically ask for them by going into the settings and then extending the number and such and such. So the, uh, and the function is seen as ending afterward. So IDA will agree with the broken emulator and not with the real hardware. And other disassembly tools will make the same mistake because uh, most good debuggers and disassemblers are written first for the PC and later extended for embedded systems. And x86 has variable length instruction since the beginning of time. Therefore, it's totally natural for an instruction to be wider than it ought to be and for the opcodes to be ignored. Exactly. So this, in summary, is a bare metal versus emulator detection, uh, similar to what was done previously on x86 uh, you know, back in 2007. Um, and we sort of were inspired by that work and by some other work to to go ahead and try to port this to modern embedded systems and see what else we could, could find there. Um, so first of all, thank you very much to the Troopers and ERNW crew for having us, uh, to the people who allowed us to work on this instead of our real paying work, most notably Travis's South Appalachian Space Agency, or <laughs> Appalachian, as he'd correct me. Um, and uh, we have some suggestions for what you may, if this interests you, aside from the giant oversized sign where Travis is trying to push the preacher wares of uh, mm -hmm. chapter 15.9. So uh, FRAC 66.12 has this article on alphanumeric uh, ARM shellcode. If you actually want to learn like, which field does what, you need to have some sort of constraint to play with. And this article is the best that you will find for learning ARM and thumb, because they take the, the somewhat arbitrary restriction that the most significant bit of every byte has to be a zero, and there can't be any null bytes. It's an alphanumeric code, right? But this means that you can't do an unconditionally executed instruction on 32-bit ARM. So you have to do an execute this if it's less than, and also if it's greater than or equal to. And then you double up the two instructions, and that allows you to get it one way or the other. Um, they're also not able to jump backward in 32-bit mode. So they have to jump forward to a 16-bit trampoline that then jumps backward. And it's by, by learning these restrictions of the kind of artificially restricted shellcode position that you have to pay attention to which flags are where and learn what the machine code looks like separate from what the assembly language would look like. Um, Ryan and I wrote uh, an introduction to ARM and, and Thumb in Pocket GTFO 11. Uh, and also one in the same release for the MSP430. So you can sort of see um, what the world looks like inside of these architectures, what your memory layout looks like, what will be in each position in the chip, and by looking at a pointer, whether you should expect it to be code or data or an I.O. region. Um, the Pocket GTFO 159 is our article on the midst delay slots and anti-emulation through that. And then 16.7 is uh, the most brilliant work involving um, pipelining that I've ever read. It, it's by a, a Scottish woman, uh, Mirabel Hearn, I believe is her name. Um, she's able to execute code in unmapped memory by leaving it in the capacitance of the data bus lines in order to dump the restricted BIOS from a Game Boy Advance. Uh, so she's actually executing code that is not there. <laughs> Um, and it works reliably enough to dump the entire ROM. Uh, it's amazing. It's very nice work. Um, so that's all we had for you today. We wanted to end with sort of 15 minutes left in case anyone had questions and we would never want to be the ones to hold you back from a coffee break. So I think <laughs> we're, we're right on target there, or a beer break. Um, so hope you enjoyed it. Um, hope it was interesting and you learned some, maybe some new things about MIPS or at least a twisted way of looking at them. We're happy to answer questions or have stones thrown at us now, either way. Cool. Any Thanks. questions, tomatoes? <laughs>
you had would have uh, like logic in the thump mode, for example? Is We've not played with that, but that would certainly work. Uh, you can also do plus three in order to jump into the middle of it that way. There's been some work done similarly in, in ARM, uh, but we have not done it in, we have not written the tool in to do it in MIPS. But. Uh, for x86, jumping one late is, was used for the early just-in-time compiler bypasses. So the, you're not able to write executable code of your own into memory, but you're able to write, say, JavaScript or Java code that gets natively compiled. So you'll XOR with a 32-bit instruction that is your real instruction, and then you just don't control the byte before it. Um, and there's, there's all sorts of fun stuff you can do in that direction. Yeah, I think that would be a really interesting next thing to do because it'll make it even more of a pain. Yeah. Um, the the uh, disassemblers tend to assume that you'll have a consistent instruction set for a given function. Uh, and I believe that Binary Ninja requires this and Ida's auto analyzer expects this. Um, so even if you're not jumping into the middle of, of an instruction, just having a single function that is both arm and thumb will make like a rat's nest for the reverse engineer to run through. It's uh, quite a pain. Yeah. Cool. All right, further questions? Yep. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's a bit r r related c question. Would it be possible to mm, build some kind of a polyglot uh, for instance, uh, w where you'd have like your executable that would one one way in ARM and the other, uh, some other way in thumb mode, but I don't know exactly how you have it kind of uh, trigger uh, one way or the other at the beginning. But mm -hmm. um, it, it's tricky to figure out um, which entry point would matter, right? So there's definitely shell code where if you branch to it in one way or the other, um, you can diverge it and then have a region that's 32-bit, a region that's thumb. For ELF executables, of course, there's a flag that, that specifies the, um, like for the, the entry points and the functions. So because each function is either at an odd address or an even address, it's hard to figure out how you would begin it in the wrong way. On, um, I, I believe that if, so you, you could definitely do that. If you're looking for one in the wild, I'm guessing that there were uh, bootable floppies that were designed to run in more than one architecture. Like maybe um, Spark and Alpha or something. Um, yeah. If you find an example of that or if you write one, please let us know. <laughs> and, and we'll uh, order another floppy drive. Yeah. Hmm. More questions? All right, then. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, cool. Travis. Thank you. Thank you.